My name is Anne Nina Puccio, and I am the executive director of the Monarch Milkweed Project. And we are based in Solana County, but we have outreach to Contra Costa County, Sonoma County, and we are also working on Napa County and Alameda County. So we are growing. We have 432 members, and we do things like outreach at fairs and festivals and everything, and we can talk more about that later. But we're very thankful that you um, that the Solano um, Sustainable Solano is hosting us for this class. And what I'm going to talk about today is how our pollinators are in crisis and why they're in crisis and what we can do about it. So let's get started. Um, where have all the monarchs gone? Our pollinators in crisis. Um, and we're stuck. What's going on? I can see your screen, Anina, but yeah, it's not moved. Yeah, yeah it's not moving. Oh, here we go. Well, let me go back. Okay, so our mission statement is the Monarch Melquid mission statement is to educate, propagate, and advocate on behalf of the Western Monarch butterfly and other pollinators. And what we mean by that is to educate, we go around and do these presentations. We do them to libraries, community groups. We do them to garden clubs. And of course, our biggest um, group that we educate is we are going through the entire school system in Solana County and educating our kids on pollinators. And in most of these elementary schools that we're going into, we can put in a pollinator garden for them. When we say propagate, we get people um, milkweed and other nectar and pollinating plants so they can help support our pollinators. Okay, so next slide. Um, this is, for those of you who don't know, I'm going to talk a little bit about monarch life cycle and some facts about monarchs. Um, the monarch life cycle is divided into four stages, as you can see here. There's the egg stage. They're very, very tiny, and the butterfly usually lays them on the underside of milkweed, and milkweed is the only thing that caterpillars, monarch caterpillars eat. It's the only place where monarch butterflies lay their eggs and it's the only thing that the caterpillars eat. And as you can see here from the life cycle, it goes from egg to caterpillar to chrysalis to butterfly. Now they have four main stages, but there are different instar states. And real quickly here, I'm gonna show you a very rare video of the monarch caterpillar being born because these eggs are so tiny, you never ever get to see a monarch caterpillar being born. They're so tiny. Um, but yeah, you see it coming out of the egg. It is so exciting that we get to see that in this video. Um, and then let me show you the instar stage. Like I said, the first stage is the caterpillar coming out of the egg. Now, the monarch caterpillar is the only inverte invertebrate that will actually grow 3,000% before it takes its chrysalis stage. And it's broken up into five instar states. So there's instar state one, two, three, four, and five. And if you have seen monarch caterpillars out there in, on milkweed, um, you will see how large the caterpillars can actually get. Um, here we go. This is the chrysalis formation. And it's pretty exciting because what happens is the caterpillar will um, start out and make a J. You see the J there in the top left-hand corner? That way, that you know is the caterpillar is getting ready to go into a chrysalis state. Now, what's really important to know is even though the only thing the caterpillars eat is milkweed, is that they can make their chrysalis anywhere. I mean, literally anywhere. I have found them in my fig tree. I have found them on my windowsills, light fixtures. 
on the outside of pots. They will travel, believe it or not, they can travel hundreds of feet to find the perfect place to put their chrysalis. And this is how it's formed. Oh, sorry. Um, okay, so the chrysalis crown. If you look at the top of this picture here, you'll see a golden crown. And that is why it's called a monarch butterfly. The king of butterflies is because it has a crown. And if you look at the black dots there at the very top of your screen, the black dots of the chrysalis, there is a way to tell before it is even born into a caterpillar, it metamorphosizes into a caterpillar that you can tell whether it's male or female. I do not have a good picture of that right now, but just know you can. But um, this will show you a monarch uh, butterfly actually emerging from its chrysalis. The chrysalis will turn um, as you can see, it's um, transparent there and the caterpillar comes out. This takes quite a bit of time. This has been sped up and it comes out and it stretches its wings. Um, and then this one shows you um, when the butterfly is fully formed and comes out of the chrysalis, you can tell the difference between male or female. The male on the left side has thinner veins and it has a small black dot on the bottom side of each inner wing. The female has thicker veins and there's no black dot. So now you can be an expert and amaze your friends and say, wow, I can tell you whether that's a male or female monarch. Okay, here we go. I wanna give you some cool monarch facts. Um, adult monarch butterflies can travel up to 3,000 miles during their northern and southern migrations each year. Now, if a monarch is born in the spring or summer, it's going to start procreating right away. But if they're born in the fall, they actually will go directly to their overwintering, overwintering sites. And the overwintering sites, there's about 400 of them in California. That's where they will gather together on roosts and they will tough out the winter months. And we will talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. They are so incredibly strong and resilient. They will fly up to 10 hours a day and they can actually travel 300 miles in one day. Um, they will fly for approximately 60 days to get to their, over, their overwintering sites. They can actually soar at heights up to 1,200 feet and live for two to four weeks. Um, and during their um, migration, and I'm going to show you that on a map, but during their migration, there will actually be five generations of butterflies. Um, because one butterfly, like I said, they only live two to four weeks and they can't travel all the way up the coast and back down. One butterfly could never do that. So there's five generations born by the time they get back down to their overwintering site. The fifth, um, the fifth is called the super generation. And they're called that because even though the other four generations will live two to four weeks, the super generation will live, they can live six to eight months. And that's because they're at the overwintering site. They go into a kind of hibernation called diapause. They slow down their metabolism and they live longer for two reasons. One, to make it through the winter. And two, the females will hold their eggs for up to eight months until they can uh, find a suitable food source of milkweed. Okay, let's talk about their migration a little fuller. On the left side of the map here um, is where, in, here's a map here that has California. Everything west of the Rockies are called Western monarch butterflies. Everything east of the Rockies are the Eastern monarch butterflies. Those will migrate. They go, uh, the Western goes from Baja, California, all the way up to Oregon and Washington, 
sometimes they're found in Canada and then they turn around and come back and they'll go to one of the overwintering sites along the coast all the way down to Baja, California. The Eastern Monarchs, their overwintering sites are in Mexico and they will fly up from Mexico all the way across the United States and up into Canada. And then there is a non-migratory population that you can see that is represented by the purple in Florida. They do not migrate. And we think it's because they might have cool condos or skim boards or something. And it's just too cool to live there. I joke. But anyway, let me tell you something about the winter, overwintering population in Mexico. They um, have overwintering sites in Mexico. We don't know all of the overwintering sites, but there's a lot of them. And what's happening, and I, I hate to have to tell you this, but farmers are growing a lot of avocados because especially we in California, but all over the place, we love our avocados. But what they're doing every single day, they're clearing the equivalent of 10 a football field worth of monarch habitat just to grow avocados. And they're taking up a tremendous amount of water. It's like 18.1 gallons of water to grow a single avocado. It's outrageous. So every time you go to the store and you buy a Mexican avocado, uh, it's killing monarch butterflies, and so much so that if something doesn't change, the eastern monarch butterfly will be extinct by the year 2050. So I'm not trying to tell you what to do with your lives, but you might think about your avocado consumption. Um, next slide here is, I'm giving you an example here of an overwintering site at Pismo Beach. Um, and this is a roost of monarchs. And the roost can consist of thousands and thousands of monarchs. Um, and they love eucalyptus trees. They will also roost on redwood trees and some pine trees if there's not enough eucalyptus trees. And they like to roost right along the coast. And as you can see here, we uh, do these counts. Xerxes, um, Xerxes Society for Invertebrates is a large organization. They're responsible for the butterfly count on the West Coast. And they have volunteers. Our Monarch Milkweed Project is one of their volunteers. And we go around and we count butterflies and at different sites. And you can see from each of these years what the totals were. Um, 2021 was really dire, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Last year wasn't great, and if you remember, we had all those horrible storms in January, and what happened? The storms killed monarch butterflies, but also because the storms and the weather went on so long, the butterfly population didn't get out um, to migrate and lay their eggs. It was late. And we just didn't see enough monarchs uh, mating and pro uh, propagating that um, are procreating that we had a, a smaller count this year. And uh, but this is how you count monarch butterflies is you look at a branch that has all of these butterflies on it on the roost and you make a circle. You make a circle with your uh, forefinger and thumb and you put it at the very bottom most of the branch and you count the number of monarchs that are in that circle and then what you do is you take your thumb and forefinger and count how many circles you've got on that branch and then what you can do is add them all up and you can get a very accurate count of how many butterflies are roosting on that branch. And then you count how many branches and you've got your totals. And what we also do is we take notes and on uh, wind and weather, all sorts of weather conditions and time of day and how many trees. And we try to get as much information as possible so Xerxes can track and they can get some good information on the butterflies. 
Okay. Um, the monarch counts in California, this shows you the counts from the late 1990s all the way through, through um, this past year in 2023. And as you can see, in 2018, 19, and 20, we had some really bad years. Um, in um, 2020, they only counted, Xerxes organization only counted 2,000 butterflies at our, efficient, our official sites, and we thought the monarch was extinct. But they bounced back the next year in 2021, and they've been uh, bouncing back. We just had a rough year this past year, so we're hopeful that this coming year will be better. We don't know. Um, and hold on a minute, the slideshow can get a little stuck, but it'll come loose here in just a minute. Um, you're still hearing me okay, right? Okay. Hold on just a second, it'll come up. Come on. Come on, come on. Ah, here we go. Okay, I just mentioned the low counts of monarchs. Uh, 30,000 monarch butterflies is the number that researchers have set as their uh, threshold for collapse of the population. We had much less than that in the year 2020, but like I said, they rebounded. Um, and it's really important to know that the monarch is considered an indicator species. And what that means, it's a reflection, an indicator of how the overall pollinator population is doing. And so if you're having a bad year with monarchs and not having very many monarchs, it also indicates that other pollinators are probably struggling too. And we're gonna talk about native bees here in just a minute, but it's really important to know that that's one of the major reasons why we count uh, monarch butterflies. Um, okay, so let's talk a minute about um, pollinators in general. In the United States, there are 4,000 uh, bee species, native bee species. We're not talking about honeybees because honeybees are not native to the United States. They were brought by, by Europeans to the um, country back, I think it was the 1700s. But anyway, native bees are things like the American bumblebee and the Western bumblebee. Um, and um, they, like I said, there's about 4,000 of them. Worldwide, there's 20,000 uh, bee species. Now, in the United States, of those 4,000 bee species, 700 of them are in California. Now, the tragedy is Eight, seven or eight of those bee species have pretty much disappeared, meaning extinct, in California and about eight or nine different states along the West and in the South. The American bumblebee and the um, Western bumblebee especially are really vulnerable. They're pretty much gone. The other one I wanted to mention to you is the rusty patch bumblebee. That used to have um, habitats all throughout the Midwest and to the East. There used to be millions of them. And in 2022, the U.S. Geological Survey came out and took a survey of all rusty patch bumblebees, and they found out that in the wild, there were only 471 left. And I don't know how they determined that, but they did. And basically, rusty patch bumblebees have been added to the extinction list. And speaking of extinction lists, last year, 21 species were taken off of the endangered species list because they are now extinct. That is a combination of animals, fish, insects. Um, and in the last 100 years, we've lost 500 different species. And a good number of those are insects. And like I said, there are lots of native bee species that are either extinct or very vulnerable. 
Okay, so let's talk about the different causes of what's going on with our monarch population as well as other pollinators. There, of course, is nothing we can do about natural causes. Be um, sorry, natural causes, diseases, and parasites. They are going to happen. Okay. And there are also predators. Now, let me tell you a little bit about wasps. Wasps are pollinators. As a matter of fact, there are seven, no, 900 species of wasps that are fruit wasps. And they are antisocial. They are not the wasps that we're all concerned about, like mud daubers or hornets or, you know, the ones that live on the ground or on your eaves. That's not what we're talking about. Um, these 900 wasps, what they do is they pollinate, believe it or not, 900 different species of fig trees. And only wasps pollinate fig trees. And if we didn't have these fruit wasps, we would not have fig trees. So I always have a conflict because I don't know what wasps are trying to kill my monarch caterpillars and which ones are trying to uh, take care of my fig trees. And it's a real issue here in Benicia because we have a real wasp problem. So I tell people to be careful and kind of consider what you're doing um, on killing wasps because a lot of people just indiscriminately kill them. And just so you know, wasps do not, these, these uh, social wasps that drive us crazy, they do not eat monarch caterpillars. What they do is they kill them and lay their eggs in them. Praying mantis is another predator. And also too, there are some uh, fly predators too. Um, so let's move on. Um, okay, let's talk about climate change. If you see here this picture on the left, that is um, a picture in the Mex one of the Mexico monarch overwintering sites. They had a freak storm that a couple of years ago that uh, a snowstorm and frost, which was not supposed to happen at that elevation, and it killed off hundreds of thousands of the Eastern monarch. Frost will kill monarchs. Um, you know, climate change, droughts, and uh, we're all, well, I'm gonna come back to herbicides and fungicides. Let me go here. Habitat loss, wildfires, droughts, indiscriminate development where us as human beings, we don't take into account natural spaces that feed our pollinators. These are causing tremendous, tremendous problems with all of our pollinators, and they are pushing pollinators to go extinct, especially our, um, not just the monarchs, but various bee species. Um, and um, what I wanna talk to you about with um, bee species um, pollinating is that our bees are very important, and the monarchs too, because monarchs are pollinators as well. Um, there are a lot of foods that we eat that must be pollinated. One out of every three bites of food that you eat must be pollinated. And if we lose um, our, our pollinators, what's going to happen is it will impact our food sources and our health. There are some food sources that cannot be hand pollinated or robot pollinated, which means we will lose those food sources. Food sources that are vulnerable include chocolate and coffee and various berries, especially blueberries. And I don't know about you, but I cannot live without coffee and chocolate. And it's very serious. And one of the things that is killing our pollinators are glyphosate and neonicotinoids. They are non-discriminate in the population elimination of our pollinators. Glyphosate destroys, kills, wipes out milkweed. It totally kills milkweed. And Bayer Monsanto sprays it, big ag. Bayer Monsanto provides 
ground up to big agriculture and they spray it indiscriminately and they kill uh, milkweed and they also kill pollinators. The good news is about Roundup is that it's being pulled off the market. The glyphosates that Bayer Monsanto lost a um, big um, lawsuit in the appeals court and they have been forced to take Roundup off the market. If you still see it in stores, it shouldn't be there because it's supposed to be off the market. Um, now, there are other pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides that are bad. Neonicotinoids are horrible. What they do, they're sprayed indiscriminately too, and they're found in some of these products down here on the left side of your page. What neonicotinoids do, like if a bee eats a plant, uh, eats pollen that is in a plant that has been sprayed, it affects their brain. It really, truly um, affects their brain to the point they cannot find their way back to their nests and they usually die horrible deaths. Now, the good news is uh, 10 states have now outlawed neonicotinoids in uh, these different products, including California. California just this year, out earlier, not this year, sorry, just last year, outlawed neonicotinoids. And you'll start seeing neonicotinoids coming off the market too. But it's not good enough, people, because even though they've been outlawed for products that you'll use at home or on golf courses or in public gardens or whatever, Big Ag is still fighting to get neonicotinoids and glyphosate sprayed on their plants. Now, the most, the plants that are mostly sprayed on are corn, soybean, and wheat. Those are the big populations. And what we always tell people is you can help by only purchasing organic, like corn, for example, purchase organic corn. If you can, organic soybean, but those are not sprayed. Uh, the other thing that is bad about neonicotinoids is that it gets sprayed onto seeds. Birds eat the seeds that have been sprayed with the neonicotinoids and they die. And it is affecting our bird population. So let's go on. We talked about habitat loss. Um, and But the good news is, like I said, is the um, monarch population has rebounded to a certain extent, and we're hoping we have a better year this year. It's going to be difficult to know because we just had some horrible storms, and we don't know if we lost a bunch of monarchs yet. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done. Okay, what can we do about it? What can we do about it? We can plant milkweed in our yards, in community gardens, in public gardens, at our schools, right? We can educate others. This is a picture of me going into Benicia High School, educating the high school kids, and we ended up setting up a high school group of Monarch Milkweed Project high schoolers. And then, of course, we can do pollinator advocacy um, to our um, local and govern uh, uh, national government legislators to save our bees and our pollinators. Um, I want to say real quickly one thing about planting milkweed. There is an organization called the Environmental Defense Fund, and they pay farmers in the Midwest to plant milkweed in their fallow grounds. So good news, good news about that. Um, so these are the type of milkweeds that people plant in their gardens. We suggest um, Arizona milkweed is basically for obviously Arizona, but um, showy milkweed is native, narrow milkweed is native, Blue milkweed has sort of become native here. It wasn't, but we see a lot of people planting that. But if you, these pictures here, it shows the balloon one or the balls there. And then the other ones are showy and narrow leaf. Um, so plant milkweed, do not please, do not plant tropical milkweed. And let me tell you why, I'm sure some of you know this. 
Tropical milkweed does not go dormant. Showy, these other milkweeds, showy and um, narrow leaf especially, they go dormant, okay? Tropical gets this diseased parasite on it called OE, and it's like, Orpho, Chris, I don't know the full long name, but anyway, it gets this um, parasite on it, and this parasite, believe it or not, only attacks and deforms and kills monarchs, monarchs butterflies to be specific, um, and it doesn't go dormant, so the pesticide is there, the pest, I'm sorry, is there, the pest is there year round. So if you can, is don't plant tropical and, and or take it out of your yard because of those pests. If you feel for some reason you must have it, then in the fall, cut it down. And that will at least kill parasites for a while. Okay, but we try to tell people there are so many other great milkweeds out there that are native, you don't need to plant the tropical. Okay, um, plants that you can plant. Oh, I love salvia so much. And the reason I love salvia, and there are all different types of salvia, is because not just monarchs love it, but bees love it. Ladybugs love it. Hummingbirds love it. It, it feeds a wide variety of pollinators, and that's always good. Let me tell you about borage. Borage is not native to California, but it is something that we plant because um, we have found out, um, scientists have found out just in the last two years that when monarchs um, actually uh, come out of their chrysalis, they will, if there's borage around, they will make a beeline for it and sip the nectar from borage because apparently it has some kind of recuperative powers. So that's a good one. You just have to be careful of borage because it can be very invasive. But goldenrod is great. Um, there's seaside daisy here in California. Yarrow is fantastic. There's lots of native plants that you can plant to fill out your pollinator garden and feed pollinators. One of the things that we discovered, we have this huge artichoke. Uh, plant. And it's very, very productive. And we got tired of the artichokes. So uh, a couple years ago, we let it just go to all the way to the flower. We ended up feeding 10 different bee, butterfly, and ladybug species. They love the flowers of the artichoke. So we were really pleased with that. Okay. Um, so please avoid pesticide use, build a monarch way station and spread the word, please. A monarch way station is a combination of milkweed and native plants that you plant in your yard to attract um, pollinators. And I'm gonna show you what those look like. And there's an organization called Monarch Watch that if you will plant a pollinator garden, you can apply to them to get a certificate and a way station sign that you can put in your yard showing that you've got a pollinator garden and they keep track of all the different pollinator gardens in the United States. Um, let me see what we've got here. Oh, this is me in my um, butterfly costume educating people. Here are some of the programs that we have that we do. We do everything from, you know, presentations to showing up at festivals and mark, uh, farmer markets. We've got lots of informational material. We actually distribute seed packets of both wild uh, flowers and milkweed. And we teach people how to plant their gardens. We have free garden consultations and things like that. Um, here's the pollinator pathway. A year ago, a year ago in February, so it's just been about a year, we put on, um, I'm sorry, not put on, we installed a what we call the pollinator pathway right next to the Vallejo People's Garden on Mare Island. 
We did this with Sustainable Solano and some other organizations. And the reason we did this is because on Mare Island, there is a historical um, butterfly overwintering site. And it hasn't had many monarchs in the past few years because there isn't a lot of nectar habitat or milkweed habitat for the Mare Island. It used to be but because of climate change, drought, wildflowers, and development, most of that habitat has disappeared. So we're trying to put it back. So with this um, pollinator pathway, what we did, it's a 3,000, I should stop there, but it didn't. It's a 3,000 square foot um, garden, uh, and it feeds eight different types of pollinators. And we have signs up that teach you about the different pollinators. It feeds beetles, butterflies, hummingbirds, bats. You may not know this, but bats are pollinators. Um, yeah, and it, it's really cool. Now, what you're seeing in this picture is we put in way stations, uh, monarch way stations, pollinating gardens in different community gardens. We have, these are showing you some local gardens in Benicia and also in Vallejo. And what this is, is we usually put in 10 foot by 10 foot or sometimes 12 foot by 10 foot or eight foot gardens. And in them, we put at least 15, 16 milkweed plants plus about 25 um, or so um, native plants. And that these gardens, these garden plots will feed hundreds of pollinators of all kinds. And it's really easy to put a garden together, a pollinator garden together, so much so that our members have put in all sorts of different pollinator gardens. You can put them um, on the ground in planter boxes. You can put them above the ground in planters. It's really, really easy. It just depends on your location, your space. Um, the smallest a uh, pollinator garden that we have put in on the ground is eight foot by six foot. But if you only have a planter box, you can do that too. And it's really easy. You just, um, if you're putting it on the ground, what we suggest to people is that you put down those big coffee roasting bags and that you put in a planter box around it because some of the native plants can be very invasive and if you, they're weeds. And if you want to control them, that makes it easier. And then you uh, put in good soil and you put in your plants and some kind of irrigation or watering system. They're all drought resistant. So you don't need to do a lot of water, but you need to water them in. And once they're established, they take very little water. And there you go. This, uh, the ones in the metal planters, what you're seeing there, they've grown just beautifully, those plants. And um, the one on the upper right here that has the planter box, it's hard to see in this picture, but the reason that it has the tall wooden piece going up is because this uh, is in a very sunny place and they put um, those um, big wooden spikes up so they can put netting over it to keep the sun out part of the time. And what we tell people is you want to plant uh, morning sun and afternoon shade, if possible, because especially here in California, it gets very, very hot and um, it will kill uh, the monarch caterpillars if it gets too hot. If it gets above 91 degrees, monarch caterpillars can suffer and die. So we tell people if you only have sunny spots, put up some kind of netting that will um, keep the sun out part of the time. And then I wanted to tell you is how can you help us? Well, the cool thing is, people, we are doing a festival. On March 19th, we are hoping to put on the largest um, butterfly festival that's ever been put on the West Coast with thousands of people there, about 160 to 200 vendors. We will have stages with music, presentations, and kids' activities. We will have workshops and presentations and demonstrations. It's on May 19th from um, 
10 o'clock in the morning to 5 o'clock p.m. And it's on Mare Island. And um, yeah, if you are interested, um, our friend here, Jazz um, Jasmine, is going to put up the event right link so that you can join us. And I just want to put up the last slide and say thank you and watch the beautiful butterfly fly away. But thank you very, very much. And I'm turning it back to Jasmine.